The Lord be with you. Let us pray. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing selfish from ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So, mistake number one in being the rector of Holy Communion is scheduling yourself to teach after Mitzi Minor. Wasn't she great? (laughs) Woo! Good night. So today, uh, I'm going to try and compare, but I'm getting myself out of Romans. We are not picking up where uh, Mitzi left off. We're just starting anew uh, with a new text. Uh, Still in Paul, though. We're still in Paul, and we're still in the undisputed Paul uh, corpus, unlike some of the letters that scholars want us to consider the authorship of. So today we turn our attention to Philippians in a class that I'm calling Encouragement in Christ, and we'll see that phrase in a few minutes. Um, Does everyone have a handout or a a handout that they can share with their neighbor? If not, we have a few more copies on the chair here at the back. Sometimes the best way to encounter a scriptural text is just to read it, and so that's what we're going to do today as part of our class is read Philippians together. Um, There's a special blessing for those who sit down and read a biblical text from start to finish in one sitting. You pick up themes and ideas that you hadn't heard before. And when Paul is kind enough to be as brief as he is in Philippians and Philemon and similar letters, we can do that. Romans, 16 chapters of dense theology, it's a little bit harder. But Philippians, we can handle. But before we do that, I want to give you just a little bit of context around the letter to the Philippians. First of all, we know that Paul is writing from prison. You'll see that uh, as we go through the letter. He's pretty explicit that he's writing from prison. He's not explicit as to which prison he's writing from. And for somebody who spends as much time in jail as Paul does, that's a relevant question. He did spend some time in Philippi in jail, and might have been writing from there. He also might have been writing from jail in Rome, where he also spent some time. Um, and scholars, the scholarly consensus is more in the favor of Rome, because he makes a claim about the whole Praetorian Guard having heard the message of Jesus because of his imprisonment. So for today, we're going to assume that he is in prison in Rome, writing back to his friends in Philippi. As I've often said, Paul is running all around the known world founding churches, and he doesn't have a lot of time because Paul thinks that Jesus is coming back when? Immediately. Immediately. Tomorrow. Don't make lunch reservations for next week because you're not going to need them, right? Jesus is coming that quickly, and he has come late to the party. All of the other disciples had the privilege to walk and talk with Jesus They went up, they saw him walking on the lake, all of this. But Paul was out there killing Christians at the time, right? Under the name Saul of Tarsus, he was the number one persecutor of the church with authority from the state to find Christians, bind them, and throw them in prison. Then he has that experience where he's going along the road to Damascus. He falls down and is blinded and gets baptized by Ananias in the house of of Judas on Straight Street, a proper name in the Bible, Straight Street on the road to Damascus. I always mention to my inquirers class, just because it's a fun little factoid, you're thinking in your mind of Paul falling off a horse when this happens. No horse in the Bible. Caravaggio added the horse in the Renaissance just so that Paul could fall off of it in his painting. In the Bible, he's walking. So just a nice little comparison there. So Paul has this experience And no zealot like a convert, right? He's come late to the party. He's had the dramatic experience of coming to faith. And he is making it his mission with the balance of his life to tell the whole known world about Jesus. So he's going from city to city. 
And he comes into the city and he tells them about Jesus and he sets up a little house church. House church is significant, right? Because this is before the reign of Constantine when Christianity and religious tolerance became legal. So all of these are um, uh, house churches that he's setting up that are illegal. They have to worship with the drapes closed and a single candle. They're under threat. The Roman guard could come and knock down the door at any time and take them all hostage because they are all violating the laws of Rome. But he sets up these little churches and he tells them this marvelous story that the God of all creation, the God who put us in the Garden of Eden, the God who gave us free choice and let us use it, the God who sent us the judges and the prophets and the kings and everybody else that he sent to try to bring us back, that God sent us his only son, named Jesus, born under the most unlikely of circumstances from a teenage, unwed, pregnant mother in a town that's literally not on the map because no one is too far gone for God. And that God died and rose again and told us that he's coming back. And my job is to tell each and every one of you that he's coming back so that when he comes back, you don't miss it. And he's running around and he's telling all these stories and he's setting up house churches and people are coming to faith and he's got these deputies who are trying to run around with him and they can't quite keep pace, but he keeps going. But what he doesn't do is stay behind to give them instructions on how to deal with their conflicts. So they all get together and they're all having a great time and they're all coming to Jesus and this is all wonderful. And then Paul leaves and he goes on to the next city and he's setting up the next church and then somebody says, well, goodness gracious, We can't have blue hymnals. We have to have red hymnals. Jesus used a red hymnal. Surely we have to have a red hymnal. And then somebody else says, no, if we have a red hymnal, we won't be able to distinguish it from the prayer book. Crazy person. They said, no, I'm not willing to give up on this. And then suddenly we have conflict. But Paul was moving so quickly that he did not have time to set up systems for dealing with the conflict. So these folks send an emissary. They send Amy. They say, Holy Communion needs Amy to go and ask this question about how we're going to figure this out. And so she comes and she finds Paul in the next city and she says, buddy, 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 I need you to come back. And he said, I can't. I have to go on. But what I'll do, I'll write you a letter. Or alternatively, as in the case of Philippians, I can't because I'm in jail, because I got in trouble in the last city that I went to. Um, So I can't come to you now, but I'll send you with a letter. And what we have in the 13 letters that have Paul's name on them are Paul's advice to his friends in these house churches that he founded and didn't stay with. These are personal letters. And just as when I write to you a personal letter, I'm going to assume what we have in common. It doesn't need to be stated. And so since, I, since Paul can assume that, we now have to back infer what was going on for the Philippians, based on Paul's writing. That's my quick orientation to Paul. Does that make sense? Questions about that while we're here? All right, let's dig just a little bit further in the context. This is before I go to the handout, so just um, be with me in your listening and in your seeing, not in your reading. We hear about Paul going to Philippi in the book of Acts which is wonderful because Acts and the epistles don't always match up exactly. Sometimes things have gotten left out or added. Um, But with Philippians, we know exactly when it happens in Acts. It's in chapter 16. In chapter 15 is when Paul proposes his second missionary journey. So he's just made this first lap around the known world. He's come back and he said, you know what? Let's do it again. Let's do it again. I got a little more gas. Let's keep going. And so he proposes a second missionary journey. And he says to his buddy Barnabas, let's go. We did so great the first time, let's go and do it again. And Barnabas says, that's great. And let's bring that little kid Mark that we picked up along the way because he's going to be so helpful to us. And Paul says, "Uh -uh -uh uh-uh, uh-uh, he deserted us back in Macedonia. And I can't have anybody on the trip who's not going to be reliable and going to stick with me. And Barnabas says, no, we need to have Mark. And Paul says, no, Mark, it's a deal breaker. 
So in chapter 15, we get a parting of ways between Paul and Barnabas over the question of Mark. Barnabas and Mark go in one direction, Paul goes in the other direction and calls whom to be with him? Timothy Timothy and Silas. Timothy and Silas. So we have a different team now than we had on the first missionary journey. We've got Paul and Timothy and Silas. And they set sail in Romans 16 and chapter 11, excuse me, Romans chapter 16 and verse 11, we set sail from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. And we remain in the city for several days. This is Romans 16 for those who might want to make a margin note. So Philippi is the first stop on the second missionary journey. They get to Philippi, they set up housekeeping wherever they're going to be, and then the scripture gives us this really interesting little reference. We went down to the river, went down to the river to pray, right? We went down to the river to see the women who were praying. Paul tells us at the beginning of his missionary journey that he wasn't seeking out the men in authority in the town. He went down to the river where the women were praying to be with them. And the first woman that we meet there is a woman named Lydia. And I love the story of Lydia, and I'm going to try and keep myself on a leash about Lydia because she could fill up a whole class all by herself. Lydia is a dealer of purple cloth. And she's the head of a household because she is able to provide lodging for Paul and Silas and Timothy. So she is a woman who deals in purple cloth, which is needed by the royalty. She is a trader at an intersection of trading routes. She's the head of a household, all as a woman. Lydia is a remarkable human being and very remarkable for her time. Lydia comes to Christ and brings her whole household with her, Romans 16 tells us, Acts 16 tells us and provides lodging for the missionaries. Then, in 1616, so we're only five verses in to to the time in Philippi here. We've already got the story of Lydia. And in 1616, we meet an unnamed slave girl, an unnamed slave girl who makes her money by divinization. So speaking to the dark spirits and figuring out what's going to happen. And she will make money this way for whoever owns her, and she will predict the future by connecting with these dark spirits. Well, Paul and Silas and Timothy arrive in the town, and they look at her, and they say, be healed. And lo and behold, the demon comes out of the girl, and she's restored to health. Well, this is good for the girl. It's good for us learning this story, seeing that the apostles have figured out what they have an awful hard time figuring out in Luke's gospel, that is, how to heal people. The disciples are having a real hard time with that where we are in uh, Thursday morning Bible study. They figured that out. We can be inspired by it. Yet another person is being healed in a story written by St. Luke, the physician. But who's going to be upset by this? Her owner. Her owner, because by removing the demon, you remove her ability to to discern the future, you remove their source of income. And that is the bridge too far. So in 1620, only nine verses into our time in in Philippi, only nine verses in to the second missionary journey, Paul and Silas are arrested on a charge of, quote, disturbing our city. They are beaten with rods and jailed in the inmost cell with their feet in the stocks. But around midnight, Paul and Silas begin to sing. And they sing the songs of faith. And as they sing, there is a great earthquake that shakes the jail and causes all the cells to be burst open. And the jailer comes in after the earthquake, and the scripture tells us that he's ready to kill himself because he knows that all the prisoners, that it's his job to keep under wraps, have escaped. But Paul and Silas call out to him and say, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Each and every one of us is here. And the jailer says to Paul and Silas, sirs, 
what must I do to be saved? There's an irony in what he said, because he was already saved, because it's all about grace. But Paul and Silas chose to remain in jail when they could have walked out the front door because they wanted to tell that Roman soldier that Jesus loved him too. They stayed in jail because they wanted to witness to the love of God in Christ. And you're going to hear a lot about that in this letter. Paul says at the end of chapter 16, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, both you and your household. That is an action-packed chapter of Acts. We have the beginning of the missionary journey, the picking of the team, the sailing to Philippi, the call story of Lydia, the call story of the woman with the spirit of divination, the arrest, the earthquake, and the conversion of the jailer, all in one chapter. And that's the background that we have for Paul's letter to the Philippians. Any questions about the background to the letter before we find our way through it? Where is Philippi? That's a great question, and I don't have my maps with me, but it's, I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to try. Um, it is in that Asia Minor region, and I'm going to put it in the wrong spot if I try. Does anybody know, has anybody been there, Mary Henry? Greasy. Greece is what I was thinking of saying. So we've got Rome sort of over here, and then you've got Greece kind of over here, and they would have had to sail across to Philippi. They are not close together. This is a big deal. And let's remember also that this is in a time before travel was efficient and inexpensive. So this is a major investment of capital, a major investment of time, a major investment of risk. And no mail service. No mail service. And in fact, on one of Paul's journeys, the ship hits the rocks. Um, and they're stranded and marooned on a little piece of rock out in the Mediterranean. So, on Crete. There you go. All right, let's take a look at Philippians. <clears throat> You'll notice that uh, some entirely too gracious scholar has provided you with some highlights as we go through. We are not going to restrict ourselves only to reading the highlights, though, because we want to be inspired by everything that Paul has to say. And I'm going to offer you that there are two major themes in Philippians. And I've highlighted one in yellow and one in green, so that as we go through, we'll be able to see where those highlights, uh, where those major themes come up. The first of the themes has to do with minds, minds. So if you'll look, please, at chapter 2, which is on page 2 in my handout. If you're reading in a Bible, we're going to look at chapter 2 and verse 1, right at the beginning of chapter 2. We do have a few more handouts if anybody needs one. Look at chapter 2 and verse 1. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing of the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And then he continues in verse 5, chapter 2 and verse 5. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. So we hear the word mind about seven times in this four-chapter letter. And we're hearing it in two ways. Be of one mind and let the same mind be in you that was in Christ. And you're going to see that theme repeated. What do you think that means? To be of one mind and then, oh, by the way, the one mind that I want you to be of is the mind of Christ. What does that mean? Okay, your action should be what you perceive what Christ would have done. Um, those bracelets, WWJD from 15 years ago, um, I always prefer to say that that should be WWJHMD, what would Jesus have me do? Because 
what Jesus would have done is walk the way of the cross, but we don't have to do that. We need to do our part now um, after that. But what would, what would Christ want our actions to be in this circumstance? What else might it mean? Brooke. Unity. Unity. Unity of mind. If we are united by the idea that we are called by Jesus Christ and that we are motivated to tell other people about Jesus Christ, that's the mind of Christ. We should be of one mind, and the whole question of the red hymnal or the blue hymnal is really not all that big a deal, right? Because we need to be of one mind, and that mind needs to be of Christ. What else? Daniel. have the Christ's perspective on the world. This is the first and the great commandment that you... Love. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, Jonathan, help me out. The first, this is the first and the great commandment. Love thy Lord the God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and with all thy soul. I do know it, I promise. And the second, is, the second is like unto it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Thank you. Sorry. Woo. Goodness, that's, that's like day one in seminary here. It's, if you don't get that, you don't get the rest. Too young, too young for my senior moments, um, but getting older every day. So, sorry? Same priorities as is in Jesus Christ, and maybe even the same priorities of Paul, which is to tell the whole world about this new faith. What else on have the same mind as Christ? Sonny. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to be of the same mind, that's going to involve some change. Wherever I was before, whatever my personal opinion was, that may need to change so that we can be of one mind together moving forward. Good. So um, I have to say, though, uh, that uh, that doesn't sound all that comfortable to me, right? I prefer to think what I think, and I prefer to do what I prefer to do. And so to say that I have to be of the same mind with all my brothers and sisters in Christ and that I have to be of the same mind of Jesus is not entirely pleasing to me, uh, which is perhaps why Paul gives us the second major theme to just sort of happy it up a little bit. And if you look back at page one, at the very bottom, you'll see the yellow highlight. Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. Philippians is all about joy. What we're going to discover as we read the letter are that there are two people who are quarreling within this system. Their names are Euodia and Syntyche, and whoever gets those when we're reading this, I'll help you out, I promise. Euodia and Syntyche are having a disagreement of some sort. And the community is starting to divide along the lines of Euodia and Syntyche's disagreement. And Paul is writing back to them and saying, it doesn't matter which ones of you are on Euodia's side, and it doesn't matter which ones of you are on Syntyche's side. What matters is that we find unity in the mind of Christ. We find unity by asking what God would have us do. And when we find that unity, we rejoice and we give thanks every day because we are gathered together as this church community, each one of us needing God's blessing, each one of us needing God's guidance, each one of us struggling to give up the I thinks of our lives to be in community with one another. And when we find that, and when we find that strength to say, we all choose the mind of Christ over our own minds. There is joy and there is rejoicing. So as we read, when we get to a green highlighted passage, you'll see that's one of the seven places that we're talking about mind. Be of one mind, have the mind in you that was of Christ, um, etc., etc. The green is the mind section and the yellow highlight is the rejoicing section. And you're going to see that Paul goes back and forth between the two. Uh, exploring one idea, exploring the other idea, exploring the first idea, exploring the other. Everybody understand? Um, these little headings that I've given you are from the New Revised Standard Version. This is the New Revised Standard translation of Philippians. Nothing has been left out, nothing has been added. 
Um, so if you opened up your NRSV at home, this is exactly what you would be seeing. Um, and what I want to ask is for, we'll go around the room and we'll do volunteers to read. And what I'm going to ask is that you read whatever the next section is with the, between those headings. Does that make sense? There are some strange names in here, and when we get to them, I'll help you out. Is anybody willing to start for me? This one or this one? Uh, salutation. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing the gospel from the first day until now. I'm confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you to be with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to understand what is best so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering and my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now as always in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy and faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in the Spirit striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. 
do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. Oh, okay. Be, hum- be humbled yourself. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We'll have another woman's voice. Thank you. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, in which you shine like stars in the world. It is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a libation over the sacrifice and the offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you also must be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I may be cheered by news of you. I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. All of them are seeking their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But Timothy's worth you know. How like a son with a father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I will also come soon. Still, I think it necessary to send to you Aphroditus, my brother and co-worker and fellow soldier, your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for all of you and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. He was indeed so ill that he nearly died. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, so that I would not have one sorrow after another. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, in order that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. Welcome him then in the Lord with all joy and honor such people because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for those services that you could not give me. Another reader? Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord, breaking with the past. To write the same things to you is not troublesome for me, and for you it is a safeguard. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of those who mutilate the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh." If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, 
a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I have had, these have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ, and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead." Reader on this side. Mark. Pressing toward the goal. Not that I have uh, already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind, and if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. Brothers and sisters, joining, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have set for us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told them, and now t I tell you, even with tears, their end is a destruction. Their, it's hard to read. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power and also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Another reader, volunteer. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Udor Uodia and Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and with the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you.
I rejoice in the Lord greatly, now that at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I'm referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share in my distress. You Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. I have been paid in full, and I have more than enough. I am fully satisfied, now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, and my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches in the glory of Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The friends who are here with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of the emperor's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Y'all just read a whole book of the Bible in like 15 minutes. Not bad. Not bad. Did you see how themes started to appear that we don't get when we just get the snippets in church? That we sort of have to piece those, these parts together? Did you pick up on some of that? Talk to me about those green and yellow highlights. Where did those... Let's start with the mind theme, which was the green highlight. How did Paul explore that question of where your mind is and with whom your mind is, is congruent? <clears throat> This can be a reflection question, too, not just a research question. Be of the same mind. The God of peace will guard your heart and your mind. Be of the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Hugh. Sure. So Hugh is referring to the hymn that Paul captures for us and reflects in chapter 2. If you want to flip to that, it's on page um, 2 at the bottom and 3 at the top. <clears throat> You'll notice that the translators of the New Revised Standard set that off as though it's poetry, which leads us to believe that it was a hymn that Paul captured and uh, put into this, into this text, so probably not original writing to him. Um, when I was reading this through aloud in my preparation, I tried to sing that part. Um, there was no tune. I just kind of wanted to hear it uh, on the voice of song. Um, and in there, we get this beautiful summary of who Christ is. Christ is pouring himself out as a libation. He took a cup of wine and said, this is my blood. He humbled himself even to the point of death. And then we see that connecting right back uh, when Paul says of Epaphroditus, he was, almost, he, he was ill, he was, almost, he was so ill that he almost died, but he didn't die, and I'm sending him back to you. And then Paul comes back to that again and says, I languish here, I'm ready to take my leave, I'm ready to go to heaven, but I stay here with you because that's what's needed of me. He humbled himself even to the point of death. And we too will humble ourselves right up to the edge of death until we make that final humbling. I think it's interesting that he picks up on the word humble there. He humbled himself even to the point of death. Because when we're talking about being of one mind, which he had referenced just before, we're talking about humbling yourself. I've said in this room before, the humility of the theologian is to say, I might be wrong. We humble ourselves by saying, okay, it's not all about me. It's about us together. It's about being of one mind. It's about sacrificing some of what I think so that we can find out what the will of God is for us together. Is that helpful, Hugh? Is there more in there for you? 
I'm getting a sort of diagonal nod. I can't tell if it's a yes or a no. Is it a challenging passage for you or an uplifting passage for you? Tell me about the hymn for you. Mm, emptied himself. Yeah, so Hugh had said that, um, Hugh was saying that the, it's the emptying image that's challenging and that the Trinity piece of that that gets even more complicated. What I'll offer is that Paul is pre-Trinitarian. So we didn't get the doctrine of the Trinity until the fourth century. So Paul is writing before we had that, when we're trying to make sense of these references to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I think for Paul, it's probably enough to say that when Jesus comes down, he gives away the privilege that is associated with him as being God, as being the master of the universe. And he chooses to empty himself in that way, to give that away, to sacrifice that privilege and become like a slave, the one at the very bottom of the rung. And I think it's also, I think Paul uses uh, slave I'd have to look it up, but in the first chapter, first verse, Paul and Timothy refer to themselves as servants, and oftentimes the Greek word in there is slave, and the New Revised Standard sort of eases it up for us. I mean, I'd, so I'd need to look back and see if those are the same word. But Paul may very well be making a connection to what we need to do as Christians, which is to give away privilege, to give away freedom and liberty, to give away independence, because what needs to happen is the gospel needs to be proclaimed. And that certainly is for him the example of his life and Timothy's life in prison. Morgan. Yes. Yeah. Morgan just offers that to be a slave is to be more than humble because it means giving away all of one's will, sacrificing all of one's will. M Margaret. So Margaret's question, is that similar to Buddhism where they kill the ego? And I don't know anything about Buddhism, so I would be stepping out beyond knowledge if I answered that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Selfishness, self-interest, self-passion, all of that. I don't know, but it certainly seems uh, similar in idea. Mm -hmm. Did I see a hand to my left? Robert. pretty close to a disagreement, yeah. What Robert is saying is that the, the, um, Paul's, Paul's um, perspective here seems to be that we need to put all of our worries, all of our anxieties, all of our hopes for the future into our faith with Christ. And that for him, that's, just, that's a little bit too far, that there's some, we have some personal responsibility here. We need to be um, taking care of ourselves in certain ways, pushing forward. Is that a fair summary, Robert, of your view? Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> Close enough for me to mess with it a little bit. <laughs> Philippians 4? Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll come back to that in a moment. So I think that Robert, I think what Robert's point is a really good one. That Paul is writing here, we, we hold Philippians up as this beautiful letter that's meant to encourage and to uplift. Missy came in and told me this morning, this is my favorite letter in the whole Bible. Um, and it's, it's one of those sort of gifts that we get. But with so, as with so many of the biblical writings, when you scratch down a little bit, it's really challenging. It's really challenging. And I think what Paul is doing is pushing right at that sense of self-independence, self-reliance that in our culture is so incredibly valuable. And he's saying, Yodia and Syneche, I don't know what you're arguing about, but you've got to figure this out. Because the only thing that matters is not what you do or what you do or what you want or what you want. All that matters is that we are completely aligned with Jesus Christ. And that's tough to hear. Pat, last word, and then I'm going to go on to joy. <laughs> so Pat is raising something that's a, a pretty common uh, offering. And when we talk about these passages, are the biblical writers talking about our spiritual lives or about our literal lives. 
And I would argue that that's a distinction that we make that these biblical writers weren't making. That Paul is saying you need to be all in in your industry, in your living, in your family life. It's we're all in here. Um, and is not so much talking about spiritual realm is over here, your professional and personal realm is over here. For Paul, I think they're pretty much one. I think they're pretty much one. That's but, the sorry? That's the unity. unity. Unity in self, unity with Christ. Absolutely. But, so, but, we love the but, right? So the Philippians receive this letter that's incredibly challenging and telling them some challenging things, telling them to get over the squabbles, telling them to unify their minds with each other and with Christ. They're getting all of this. They're feeling uncomfortable about it. But then throughout, Paul sticks in those passages that I highlighted in yellow and even one more that I missed as we were reading it together. I noticed there was a joy reference that I didn't pick up. He sticks in those yellow references about joy, what, what purpose do those serve? Why does he have these two themes interlocked with each other? Eye on the prize. I love it, Eleanor. Thank you. Keep your eye on the prize. What else? We can rejoice always because God is always with us. I love it. What else? Mm -hmm. As we begin to rejoice, it literally lifts your spirits, and then it starts to perhaps make it easier to get along with your neighbors. Even so, it's amazing. Amazing what happens when you live in a spirit of gratitude um, and how that impacts your uh, life in all other areas. It's just infectious. What else about this joy? Barbara. Even though he's perplexed. Yes. Yeah, Barbara just held up that Paul's love for the Philippians, reflecting um, the love of Christ is so evident in the letter, and it's, it absolutely is. Throughout it, you can see he's writing to close friends. He's writing to people that he really cares about, um, and he's trying to lift them up. You can also see, as Paul loves to do, and I love to critique him for, he loves to hold himself up too. If anybody has reason to be confident in the flesh, it's me. If uh, anybody knows what suffering is, it's me. If anybody knows what, um, what it is to be rich and to be poor, it's me. And please continue living the life of faith. And what example will I give you of how to use, how to live the life of faith? It's me, it's me. So, you know, you got to love Paul for all of his intricacies here. Um, this is a mortal, flawed human being writing to us about matters of faith. And we've got to hold on to that too. Yeah, there's nothing lonelier than one who doesn't reach out to others. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Let the same mind be in you that was in Jesus Christ, and as you get to that place, rejoice. Please. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so Peggy has just asked a question for which I don't have the answer, so I'm just going to dismiss the question and move on to one of my own. No, sorry. <laughs> She said, practically, how long does it take for one of these letters to get from where Paul is to where it needs to be? Um, and that's a good question, and it relies on the question of where he's in jail. So if he's in jail in Philippi, probably not all that long. If he's in jail in Rome, there's a, there's a difference. And if Aphroditus is going to have to carry that letter, get on a ship, make his way across the um, Mediterranean or the Aegean Sea, get into Philippi, and remember, still illegal to be a Christian, so he's going to have to do it with the letter tucked in his pocket and move along so that he escapes notice and then find his way to the house church, and we're probably talking about some time there. Yeah, it's different. Now we expect, you know, if I can't, if we can't have it right this very minute, then, uh, you know, and don't you love those emails where you send it, and then like two or three hours later, did you get my email? I sent it. <laughs> I was expecting an immediate response. Where, where is your response? Um, you know, that, that sort of feeling. Right. Let's talk about joy for a second before we run out of time because I do want to, um, I want to set up the next class and I want to end on the more joyful note. I think that Paul marries this idea of conformity with Christ and unity with each other with joy for two reasons. First of all, because when you achieve it, you achieve freedom. When you can let go of it, all, the whole world depends on me, you can achieve freedom. You can be free. Not in the sense that you can go and do whatever you want. That's a very commercialized idea of freedom. 
but you can be free in your soul. You can be free knowing that you are loved just as you are, just as God made you, not because of what you do, not because of how much you earn, but because of who you are. And you do not need to go through this world saying, I wish I were like, if only this, if only that. That's freedom, as the gospel writers understand it. Knowing that you are a reflection of the image of God and knowing that God loves you is freedom and liberation from all of the other stuff that we try to put on top of you. And there is great joy in that. And I think he marries this joy theme and this um, unity theme because the unity part and the conformity part is hard. And as we were sitting here talking about it, you could sense in the room, well, this isn't very much fun. I thought Philippians was the fun letter. And then he tucks in the joy part, remember the goal, remember what happens at the end. We have this strange character, Epaphroditus, that we only meet here. He doesn't appear in other places. Um, he's uh, believed to be the carrier of the letter, the person that uh, Paul says, I'm sending to you to him, even though you want Timothy, receive this guy instead. Um, my joy will be complete and all that, um, in knowing that he's with you. Uh, so Epaphroditus goes, and then in the fourth chapter, when we hear about Euodia and Syntyche's dispute, he refers to sort of a mediator in there, and that mediator is unnamed. But it's possible that Paul is sending Epaphroditus to carry the letter and mediate the conflict. Go back, get things squared away, remind them of the joy and the spirit that we had when we started that community of faith, and then come back. So that's the offering. Daniel mentioned that my post-Eucharistic blessing follows from this as well. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Why? The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God. Let's stop right there. Let your requests be made known to God, and all of your requests will be granted exactly as you asked. Right? That's what Paul said, isn't it? Let your request be made known to God, and the God of all creation is going to do what you want him to do, Marianne, is just as long as you say thank you first. That's how it works. That is not how the system works. Take all of the weight, take the anxiety, take all of the obligations, take all of the ways in which we don't feel worthy, that we don't feel up to snuff, that we wish God had made us a different way. Take all of that, all of those requests, all of the I wish you hads, God. Present them to God in a spirit of thanksgiving. And God will give to you a sense of peace. An abiding sense of grounding peace. You may not get the winning lotto ticket. You may not get the parking space at the Walmart. But you will have peace. And in that peace, you can rejoice. And you can rejoice always. Why? Because the Lord is near. That's what Philippians promises, is that when we align with God, the Lord will be near and our joy will be known. Next week, we're going to come back and look at this letter two ways, but here's my parting comment for you. You all have the complete letter in front of you. It's also in all of your home Bibles, so feel free. It's nothing new here. This is not hot off the press. Um, take a read through it and ask yourself this question. Is Paul speaking to me today in the 21st century, or is Paul speaking to us as a community in the 21st century? As modern readers of this text, not going back to what did Paul mean, but as modern readers of this text, is Paul speaking to me or is Paul speaking to us? And that's where we'll pick up next week. Church starts in 12 minutes. <laughs>